My name is Rob Verkirk. I'm a PhD scientist. Um, I did my studies at Imperial College London. I did my master's degree there, PhD, and then seven years postdoctoral research. My field of work was, was in sustainability and in particular sustainable agriculture, looking at whole systems and how you can um, create stability in these natural systems around ecological principles. Over the last 20 years, um, since I, I set up the Alliance for Natural Health um, back in 2002, so 18 years ago, we've been really applying these sustainability principles to healthcare. So our overarching mission is developing systems of healthcare that work with nature rather than against it. So it's really about protecting and promoting natural systems of healthcare. This is partially about science and medicine and ecology, but it's also about economics. It's also about social issues, political issues. And we use this systems approach to try and find ways of bringing together. We are a true alliance of interest from everything from practitioners to members of the public through to companies and other stakeholders so that we can try and get consensus towards um, essentially having a more responsible way of looking after ourselves and our planet. We, we are deeply involved in the entire COVID area. Um, our COVID zone curates a very wide range of issues from what is happening in the peer review. And let's remember right now, peer review processes for many journals around the COVID area is actually on hold. So there's this massive number of papers coming through that have not yet been peer reviewed that relate directly to COVID. So we're tracking all of that. But we're also tracking what governments are saying, what other commentators are saying, and, and looking at the social impacts of, of uh, the huge changes that we are, have been forced to endure as of a few weeks ago. So central to that and central, I think, to your practitioner base is the fact we are dealing with a phenomenon that relates to the most sophisticated control system we know about, which is the immune system. And it's, it's unfortunate, really, in what governments have been doing, that there's very, very little talk about the immune system or what can be done to enhance it, um, to improve its function, when we know that in 98% plus of people, that's what's doing most of the job. All the people that are asymptomatic, we still don't have um, a firm number in which scientists can agree on how many people are asymptomatic, but it's very likely to be already a majority. Um, in those people, the immune system is doing a fantastic job in a very small number of people. And of course, we're starting to understand the nature of that susceptibility, age, comorbidities, um, particularly hypertension, um, other forms of, of heart disease, um, cancer, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, uh, a history of pulmonary or, or lung diseases. These are all features that inevitably make the lungs more sensitive and make the immune system that is the, the mechanism that, that we use to protect ourselves from invasive new pathogens um, less effective. And it's, it really is, uh, we, we've been busy filling some of those gaps. Some of it is occurring at a fairly basic level so that practitioners can take assets that we produce like videos and allow um, their, their clients and patients to actually develop a, an understanding of it, if you like, a, a 101 on the, on the immune system. Other parts of it are, are more sophisticated, where we're looking um, at cutting-edge dosing and nutrients that can be used, that are being used, as we track the work that's going on around the world, specifically with this disease. And, of course, there's also this huge repository of information we have from a diverse range of practitioners that have had decades of engagement with um, respiratory infections, with um, viral infections, 
and bringing all of this together um, is proving pretty useful. We, we are in the background also helping people develop um, you know, new systems for monitoring so that they can actually develop their own trials. Um, we, I, I hadn't mentioned it at the outset, we do have a consultancy. So we have been working specifically with companies that are doing research on their own products in this area as well. So it's really about how you can look at the full picture. And, you know, we're, we're looking very carefully at what's happening in, in intensive care. The, the bottom line is, for example, in the UK, it's a rather abysmal situation that if you find your way into an ICU in the UK, you have only a one in two chance of coming out of it alive. Um, we were told that ventilators, Dyson received an order for 10,000 ventilators, were going to be vital in keeping people alive. We now find that actually ventilators probably accelerate the rate of, of mortality. People who become intubated on a ventilator um, rarely get off it. Um, when you then start tracking the epidemiology, the effect of the virus on populations, you also start to see some rather interesting trends. We are over the, the worst hump, but we have got there largely through social distancing and natural immunity. Many people believe that the, the fact that we are, if you look at the daily occurrence of new cases, that we're kind of, we're getting there. It's the social distancing that, that's worked. And of course, what we are doing is, as we're hearing from Neil Ferguson and others on a regular basis in the government, that we are flattening the curve. That flattening of the curve, what it does is protect acute care facilities from a surge in numbers that they may or may not be able to deal with. But what it doesn't do is reduce the total number of people who become infected. And actually what we do is probably increase the chance of seeing a surge as we approach next winter, because there are a whole range of environmental and climatic factors that come into play with these respiratory viruses. We will almost see, almost certainly see a, 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 a natural reduction in the um, transmissibility of the virus as we move into the summer months in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and because it's likely that social distancing will have reduced the total number of people who've been exposed, um, natural, naturally acquired herd immunity will be lower than it would, would have been had the virus just run through its natural course. So we may expect to see a, a, a pronounced spike as we move to, to next winter. So um, you've got to look at the whole background, you know, whose interests is this in keeping a lockdown? You know, what about discussion on many of the other strategies? How many people are looking at ecologically based strategies when you try and combine and understanding what this virus does together with what we know the immune system can do together with human behavior and you then also shield the vulnerable groups and you use antigen and antibody testing as intelligently as possible so you have the max amount of information frankly we are a long way away from more sophisticated approaches like that and again in the information that we're providing we hope we are informing significant numbers of people to take more responsibility in, ter in terms of practitioners to communicate that information onto their clients i think there are a number of things that that look promising um it's ironic that in the uk because you've got this huge um, you know, behemoth of a still pretty remarkable system called the National Health Service. We're still not seeing a lot of innovation going on, which is why the ICU mortality rate is still around about 50%. But in other parts of the world, we're certainly seeing innovation. Um, in China, we've seen it. In the US, we are beginning to see it. And that innovation um, involves often a combination of multiple things. So some of it is completely non-therapeutic. It's the idea of, for example, because 
we're dealing with acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, but it's a novel form. It, it, it presents in a different way. So the, the simple process of proning people, turning patients over so they can breathe when they're on their front rather than their back, makes a huge difference to outcomes. Um, uh, the timing of interventions is also really crucial. If you leave it too late and that hyper response in the adaptive acquired immune system has already built up, it makes it so much harder to, to, to bring um, a patient back, particularly once you, you've seen the hyperinflammation and then have suffered lung damage. But when it comes to therapeutics, there are some interesting combinations that seem to be yielding um, very promising results. Um, there are over um, 400 clinical trials currently registered on the nihclinicaltrials.gov website, which is not just trials relating to the United States, it's trials globally. Um, and we're gonna be expecting to see um, results of many of these trials um, in the next few weeks. Some of them are drip feeding already through the system. Um, there is no doubt that um, there are certain repurposed drugs like hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, the antimalarial, that is showing considerable promise. Um, anti-inflammatories and antioxidants uh, and even anticoagulants used at the right time are showing promise. Um, we're seeing um, from a naturopathic point of view, really interesting data beginning to emerge on, on vitamin C and particularly IV vitamin C. Let's remember when you use vitamin C in an acute care environment, it is really working as a drug. You are delivering um, 20 grams or more per day directly into someone's vein um, at the specific point where you need it most, which is in the alveolus sacs deep in the, the lower lung. Um, the mechanism actually involves the production of hydrogen peroxide. So if you use the wrong protocol, and sadly, we're seeing in some of the New York hospitals around about half the required dose being used, it's unlikely that they're going to get the same positive results where a higher dose is used. So the protocol is very, very important. We're seeing also other data coming through showing a very clear link between um, vitamin D deficiency and worse outcomes. So it's really, really important that some of these incredibly basic and cheap vitamins um, from vitamin A to vitamin D um, uh, and then looking at other minerals, obviously selenium, zinc um, are really, really important at the right dosage to ensure that the immune system is properly primed. Many of these vitamins have are known as essential vitamins because they are essential to life. We cannot produce them, we need to consume them endogenously. And it is their role in the immune system, which is the most important system that kind of separates us from the outer world and the pathogens and all the things that could potentially kill us, um, th that, that actually makes them essential. So we, we see with older people, often acute deficiencies in some of these nutrients, partially because they are eating less, partially because they are absorbing less, they're suffering often malabsorption problems. Um, and if you add to that the fact that um, people are being told to stay indoors at a particular time when it's so important that people get that outdoors and start producing um, you know, vitamin D naturally through sunlight, um, there are some real mixed messages going out to people. So everything that can be done to ensure that the immune system is primed, that doesn't just involve nutrition, uh, really, really important to be thinking about all other aspects of our, our wellness. And of course, um, people being in a very anxious state, we know that anxiety is, is very strongly correlated with um, uh, adverse immune function. Really important that everything is done to try and keep people in a positive state 
um, where they're not all the time immersed with negativity and um, with, with what's going on. A lot of the news on this subject is badly taken out of context. So it triggers an, a huge amount of fear in people without actually suggesting to them that this is part of a process that we need to adapt to. We've done it hundreds, thousands of times before throughout human evolution. We'll do it again. We'll come out of it stronger and we'll learn hopefully to function better as a community. There, there's got to be a silver lining to the cloud. Yes, I, I, I will start by saying that I'm, I'm not a supporter of suggesting that 5G is involved with causation. Um, I, I believe there is, um, if you look at the fact, the pattern of distribution of uh, the um, COVID-19 hotspots, they are often associated with places that have very high populations. Those are equally places where there's been a huge push on 5G. Um, having said that, I'm, um, as a scientist, a signatory um, to the, um, scientists, the, the, the scientific appeal against 5G. The, the reality is that when governments have signed up to 5G, they have done it without necessarily providing adequate information to the public. There are still no full studies looking at the implications of 5G rollout on biological systems. So the, the, the 5G that some people already have on their phones is not really 5G um, in terms of the Miller wave, use of the Miller wave technologies, the frequencies that allows a much broader bandwidth to be applied so that the internet of things and driverless cars and Netflix on everyone's televisions simultaneously throughout the world, um, along with cat videos, can all happen um, s simultaneously without any, any downers. And of course, I do believe probably the closest we can get in terms of linkage is that the fact that so many people around are in the world are currently in lockdown, what we will hear afterwards is government saying, we told you we need a new system that allows much larger levels of data to be transferred simultaneously. Now, when you do that, you use a new to nature frequency in the form of these Miller waves, you massively increase the number of small antennae to which we're exposed, which roughly is going to be every hundred or meters or so along the typical residential street. But because the transmission through um, solid surfaces is not good, Miller wave technology doesn't even transmit particularly well through your hand or through the leaf of the trees, people will need to have additional antennae within their dwellings. At the moment, there is no talk or consideration of the fact that certain biological systems are more sensitive than others. So imagine if you had your newly born baby with a small antennae over the head, what would be the implication? And frankly, we don't know. Uh, further than that, there are probably going to be, the estimates are suggesting an increase from three to 4,000 satellites that are currently in operation to upwards of 20,000 satellites. So this radiation will be beamed down. Now, the implications, I talk about biological systems. If we look at all the other aspects of our ecology that we are dependent on, from insect pollinators through to migratory birds, what on earth might be the impact on those? And frankly, our view is that the precautionary principles should be employed if we do not have the data and we're using a novel technology that has the potential for harm and there is more than adequate data that has already been um, produced through the bioinitiative report with the existing wave radio frequency wavelengths, we should be very concerned about a mass rollout. Well, the, the reality is that huge tracts of the population are immobilized by fear. And in biology and ecology and throughout entire evolution of animal systems, fear has been 
um, a process that creates inactivity. This idea of being paralyzed by fear is a natural process. It is part of a biological response that um, actually um, selects for survival, increased survival. Um, call it playing dead. Now, the difficulty about that process where you kind of move away from the reasoning mind, that the, the, your prefrontal cortex that, that allows you to think and reason and do all the sophisticated things that we associate with civilized societies, that all disappears. And you basically revert um, either to your amygdala, your, your midbrain, where you are um, have a very primitive system for gauging fear, um, or you can, you know, even um, revert to an even simpler state where you go to your your hindbrain, you, back into your limbic system, um, which is which is where you're at this place of complete inactivity, and if you sustain that fear in an individual, which is something that does not occur in nature, has not occurred through our evolution, you create an entire change in brain chemistry and physiology that is extremely damaging for your health. Um, one of the systems that gets really damaged by that is the immune system. Um, so if you want to be part of the 98% that deals with the interaction with SARS coronavirus to the uh, virus that causes COVID-19, it's really important that you come out of a place of fear. You get into a place where you are positive. Um, you allow your neural networks to engage, you know, and build um, around positivity. So you are in a position to do a range of things for you and your loved ones that facilitate survival. And that is really, really essential. And most of the government messaging, most of the media messaging is just keeping people into uh, a, a place of, of fear. Now, you, you ask, how do we go about making these changes? And three really simple ideas is firstly, being really conscious about what you let in. Your thoughts make who you are. They create hardwired patterns of neural networking that become instilled. If you trigger fear every time you're exposed to an experience that reminds you of that, you will move back to this primitive behavior in which you detach essentially your reasoning, rational mind. Um, so really be conscious of what you let in and probably right now, the single most important thing you can do is turn off the news. Don't let it be running 24 seven, hearing all the bad news, because that bad news, you know, if you look at the, the death rate for COVID-19 in a given day, you're not being given to context. You're not being told this is the death rate alongside the number of people that would have died from seasonal flu on that day alongside the people who would have di died from heart disease or cancer that day. And actually, the numbers that you're seeing that sound so scary on their own are not particularly scary when they're seen in context of other numbers. So be careful about what you let into your conscious mind. Spend time engaging in things that are more positive so you fire up those neural networks that are associated with positivity. The second thing, is really about managing your autonomic nervous system. And your autonomic nervous system, you can argue, is controlled to a large degree by your breathing. And the very fact that, um, for example, if you, if you look at most of the great traditions, um, and even, dare I say, it, Western traditions, you know, when, you, when you're faced with a shock, you, people might tell you, take some deep breaths when you look at some of the great traditions like Ayurveda or, or, or Chinese medicine, there is a huge emphasis placed on breath work. And what slow, deep breathing will do is actually trigger the autonomic nervous system, uh, and particularly the parasympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system, that is, if you like, in layperson's terms, the rest and digest side. So 
again, what happens is if you're placed under um, chronic stress, chronic anxiety, you actually remain in your um, sympathetic nervous system in which you are going to disengage your prefrontal cortex. Um, you're going to change your chemistry that will work adversely for your immune system and actually in the long term reduce your risk of survival um, potentially quite significantly, massive increase, massively increase your um, risk of mental health problems, increase your risk of cancer, increase your risk of heart disease, increase your risk of insulin resistance, um, pretty much all the major chronic disease risks go up if you can't get into a place where your body can actually settle down. Now, when you eat, it's also incredibly important to you know eat al fresco and not al desco, as we often say. There are so many people eating at their desks in front of computers, often engaged in stressful activities or seeing stressful information. It is impossible for you to extract nutrients adequately from your food if, if you do that. Um, and really engage in mindfulness and breathing techniques um, that, that will help you uh, move towards your, um, you know, your parasympathetic nervous system. Um, you can use heart rate variability as a technique. You can use a simple ECG sports chest strap that talks to um, an app. Um, the one I use is HRV Elite that will measure your morning um, uh, HRV status. Um, it's a really important gauge to see how effective um, your various practices are in engaging your sympathetic um, um, nervous system. So the final thing is really around appreciation. Um, appreciation, again, is built into all the great philosophies. We do not do an, enough of it. Yes, at the moment, um, in the UK, 8 p.m. on a Thursday night, we are clapping the NHS. Um, and then we're going away and forgetting about it after that. Um, but there are so many others that need to be appreciated, the people around us, um, the people who are still working in farms to make sure that we have fresh foods, um, the, 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 the people who are helping others um, getting food to, to care homes, for example. Um, but particularly around our families and our friends and our friendship groups, reaching out to people who have cared for you and you responding and showing appreciation for them is incredibly important. And there's a huge amount of science that's building in this area. Having purpose, um, finding meaning in life is really, really important for a whole range of physiological, um, mental health and even um, spiritual development processes. So um, look at the system as a, as a whole tackle it from as many different angles as possible um, but you know we have so much control in our health status and we cannot just rely on what we're told to do by governments one of the most important things in terms of the um, information around COVID-19 is that it is changing week on week and it's one of the reasons that we have developed a COVID zone on our website. It's visible front and center when you go onto our website at anhinternational.org. And in it, we are maintaining a tracker. Um, we've got all the videos, the webinars, and other um, uh, di you know, different articles and, and webinars we, we've been engaged with, but the tracker is actually tracking a huge amount of information from around the world, particularly in the scientific domain, but also in the media domain. Um, and really the most important thing I can recommend is for people to keep a regular eye on that because it will fill numerous gaps that you're not getting filled um, via information from the mainstream media. The other thing I'll say is that there are obviously some real concerns about the impact of social distancing and lockdown on us as a society and yes being very aware of the indirect knock-on consequences of that including to our civil rights our civil liberties including um, relating to the fact that it is quite possible as and when 
a vaccine is developed, that that vaccine will be pushed on us um, in no uncertain terms. We have to um, understand exactly what our rights are. We've seen just in the last few days um, a leading uh, medical lawyer in Germany um, be uh, uh, arrested and, and actually for a short period being put into a psychiatric institution, which is something we thought um, was happened uh, historically, but not in the current era uh, in Germany. Um, so we're seeing some very significant pressures on our civil rights. And if we are to have the right to access and use natural forms of healthcare, we have to understand the legal situation and our fundamental rights and freedoms from a human rights perspective. And again, we're going to be tracking all of that through the COVID zone. So eyes wide open as we move forward.